Hope Christadelphians present This Is Your Bible, a program dedicated to the study of your Bible to learn about the wonderful future that God has planned for this earth. Join us now as we open up the Bible and reason together around God's Word. Hello again and welcome back to This Is Your Bible. My name is Tony Fratello. I'm your host today, and I'm here with Bible student Dennis Davis. And we're discussing a very important subject, the perfect marriage, Paul's mystery. Uh, This is discussion uh, part two. Uh, Dennis, in our last discussion uh, in this important subject, we concluded by looking at Ephesians chapter 5, and I had asked you, in part 2, are we going to go back to the Old Testament in Genesis and look where it all began? Oh, absolutely. And we might just take a quick look to tie things in at Ephesians, the fifth chapter, at the very last verse. As you know and remember, Paul is giving advice and commands to both wives and husbands. And at the very conclusion of instructing wives and husbands based on what the Lord did for the church, he says this, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And of course, as himself means as if the wife is a part of his body, a member of his body as an arm is or a leg. And to the wives, he says, and the wives see that she reverence her husband. This is a quote from Genesis, the second chapter, and it is attributed to Adam in Genesis, but it is attributed by Paul to the spirit. This great mystery. And as we had considered in part one, this great mystery is a great plan. It is something that was thought out well before the time of Christ and well before the time of Paul, all the way back to the creation of man, which we read of in Genesis chapter 1. We see in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So mankind is the focus of verse 27, and it takes both creations, man and wife, to make the complete mankind. In chapter 2, the account continues in verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. In the rest of this chapter, we see that There were many creatures that were created by our Father, and not all of them, in fact, none of them, were created out of the side of any other creature, not male and female. All were created from the dust. It was at this point in verse 18 that the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So there's a recognition on the part of the father that the man is lonely and that it is not good for him to be alone. And none of the other animals created from the dust of the earth were created in the fashion that woman is about to be created. Bear in mind in verse 18 that this is the leading thought As we continue in the verses, Adam is lonely. And what happens in verse 19? Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And all the while Adam is doing this, he is very aware he's alone. None of the other creatures are in this position, the male and the female brought before him. In verse 20, he gives the names to the cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast. 
but we see the continuing theme of these verses. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. He's alone. He feels it. The Lord God recognizes it. And in verse 21, it is when the Lord God causes a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And Adam here is a living parable. It was a deep sleep that was produced by the Lord so that the formation of a wife could take place. Almost kind of like a death state that he put Adam into, yes? Yes, absolutely. It is the death state that the Messiah had to endure to bring his wife life. He first had to overcome and open a way. And this is thoroughly considered in both the Old and the New Testaments of Scriptures to show that link that Paul is driving home in Ephesians chapter 5 on how men and women ought to treat each other as husband and wife and why. So this isn't just another story you read and pass by, is it? It's something marvelous taking place here. Oh, something very profound because as we go to Ephesians, we can see that Paul is using this example to illustrate that a before the time, God was aware of how he would direct things. Mm -hmm. And he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak of Christ and the church. And here it is with a man and a woman that were created in and of itself, unbelievable power to orchestrate such an event. But then on top of that, what kind of power is it that foresees and outlines a plan that will go through time that passes to the birth of the Messiah and then his compliance with the Father's will in sacrificing himself for his wife while, says Paul, she was his enemy. Christ understood this. Christ knew what these verses were indicating and the direction they were taking. Hence, we find that in verse 22, the rib which had been taken from Adam, the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And this is the part that Paul quotes. This is Adam speaking, but Jesus, of course, and Paul, attribute this expression by Adam to the Spirit. So the Spirit moved Adam to say these things to shadow something yet future. He says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Again, that same symbology with one flesh, the oneness that God wishes to share with his sons and daughters, that a plan was in the workings. It was to be the Messiah who would cleanse and purge this wife, which has not happened yet. It's a process still underway. And as you have pointed out several times, something that men and women need to consider as they marry one another with his example and the example of the church bearing that always in mind. In Matthew, the 19th chapter, if we could turn to that, Jesus himself comments upon this section of scripture. And we can see just how far marriage in the days of the apostles had deteriorated by the encounter with the Pharisees that Christ underwent. In the 19th chapter, at verse 3, we see that the Pharisees come also to Jesus and they tempt him. They think they have a question that they can ask him that will prove he doesn't understand the law of Moses that they can demonstrate to the people he really is a fake. 
here's a question that if he answers it as he's presented other things, it will show him for the fraud that he really is. We often see that, don't we, in the New Testament, the religious leaders of that day uh, putting him to the test or challenging him on the uh, scriptures. Often they did not want to see an end to what they were involved in with their power, their positions, their particular circumstances that they regarded as esteemed. In fact, that same attitude can be seen in how they treat their wives, and it appears here. And it's a terrible position. They're very egotistical, so to speak, very self-assured of their position in the kingdom of God, and yet they lack the basic knowledge of what the Creator was trying to express by taking Eve from the side of Adam. They totally miss the love and affection that the Messiah showed the church in laying down his life by anticipating her cleansing. While she's still his enemy, he goes through these things. We see that the question that the Pharisees ask is, in verse 3, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And their particular viewpoint said that it was, and they got it from Moses. They understood that Moses said, you can divorce your wives, and they used it as more of a luxury to marry and to divorce at will. However, they saw fit with no idea of the sacrifice that the Messiah was about to undergo for his bride. And Jesus answers them in verse 4. He says, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And here's the verse that interests us, verse 5. And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. The idea of divorce was never there. She's a part of him. She can't be taken away from him. She's a member of his body. And that is so critical to remember, and it is brought out by Paul in his great mystery. Well, you know, it's very clear to me and our viewers, I'm sure, that this subject is a large subject, and we've looked at three, maybe four passages of Scripture, and we can already see the implication of what took place in the very beginning with Adam and Eve, and throughout time, the, the, the symbol or the parable, if you will, um, that would unfold uh, regarding Christ and the church, the believers. So uh, as much as we would like to continue discussing this Day after day, uh, our time is limited, but we very much wanted to thank you for coming here and having this important subject with us and discussing the perfect marriage, which hopefully we're all trying to uh, achieve, uh, not only for healthy relationships, but also that we might please our creator who instituted um, marriage in the first place. So Dennis, thank you again for being here and um, for your uh, wonderful uh, uh, walk through the scriptures. Oh, thank you. Uh, we'd like to thank you for uh, viewing this program. This was, again, part two of our discussion on the perfect marriage. Uh, please look for part one if you have not seen that, and um, we will see you again next time. For information on Bible subjects, go to thisisyourbible.com and download from a range of articles and booklets. Sign up for free online Bible courses. Watch videos of Christian professionals showing how their work reinforces their belief in the Bible. Search a list of Bible questions and answers on key Bible themes. Thisisyourbible.com has answers for you.